<clears throat> All right, so this is a lot like what we discussed last week in regards to caterpillars and microarrays. And so this was one of the earlier um, studies that I had done in the lab where we looked at caterpillar expression in regards, regards, regarding herbivory again using microarrays and qPCR. So next week we'll probably talk about qPCR and or um, this plant responses in general to herbivory and things like that, a more traditional textbook kind of lecture. But I wanted to go ahead and share this one. I'm actually working on a book chapter that's due at the end of, probably due in the next week or two. I should have done a lot more to it, getting it done sooner. But it's looking at caterpillar saliva, and uh, you can imagine, and on plants and how the plants kind of respond to it, as you all already got an idea about now. So that's actually something I'm actually doing currently is trying to write a book chapter on that. And I'm about halfway done. So anyhow, um, this was one of the first studies that we had done looking at, uh, again, Helicoverpa zea. It's a generalist caterpillar. You know a lot of this already, so I don't need to invest a lot of energy in it to it at this point. But again, it's you know a serious pest that feeds on all sorts of different plants. And it has salivary factors like glucose oxidase that can alter the plant defenses along with other uh, salivary compounds. I've already discussed saliva and regurgitant. We know that regurgitant includes mid-gut proteins and saliva and factors that the caterpillar ate. It's, if we push on a stomach, if, it was, if this caterpillar was present here, it would be extending beyond the screen. So we're just looking at the front part of the caterpillar. And this is, of course, including basically what it threw up and its head is down here and its mouth is underneath this green goo. And then over here, we have our caterpillar with the sharp mandibles and spinnerets. And so when I talk about saliva, I'm usually talking about what is coming from the actual salivary glands, as I mentioned before. So we have a little droplet of spit here. And then the mandibular glands also have saliva. The saliva coming from the spinneret tends to be watery or silk and proteinaceous. And then the mandibular glands tend to be more oily. And so again, these salivary glands are really large. So here's the labial salivary glands. And so if I dissected you, it'd be again, slicing you open, you would have um, salivary glands going from your neck all the way down to your knees. So these are huge structures. And so these are the labial ones that's secreting from the spinneret. And then the mandibular glands are the oily glands in the middle. And then of course, I've already talked about these other structures like this white tissue around is the fat body. It's like the liver. We got the air tubules, which are um, come from the spiracles and stuff like that um, for air. Um, so anyway, the mid gut is filled with food in this picture. So again, the fat body would be like the liver and, and fat storage and so forth. So in the labial glands is glucose oxidase. And again, what does this enzyme do? It basically converts glucose to gluconic acid and hydrogen peroxide. So that is what that enzyme uh, is responsible for. Um, again, we've shown some studies that from our own lab and others that it may have um, antimicrobial properties by forming hydrogen peroxide, but it also seems to be affecting plant defenses. In tobacco, it seemed to suppress the induction of nicotine, but in tomato plants, it may actually have an effect of stimulating plant defenses or at least not particularly suppressing at least the famous anti-nutritive defenses like protease inhibitors, polyphenol oxidase, and things like that. So as you know, I've gotten at uh, preventing this caterpillar from secreting saliva by utilizing a cauterization technique to burn the spinneret, or I use a surgery to remove the labial glands. So here's the cauterization. So you can see the nice cone shape intact spinneret. And then I use a hot needle and just push against it. I'm mangling up the spinneret and then 
essentially blocking the hole so it doesn't secrete labial saliva from it. I then allow the caterpillars, as you know, to feed on glass fiber disc. And the glass fiber disc contains glucose and sucrose. And so when it feeds on it, the sucrose attracts the feeding. So this is the feeding damage of a caterpillar that was sitting on it. Well, if it has a cauterized spinneret, you notice that the glass fiber discs are lighter tan color, they're whitish. And then over here with the, or with the cauterized, and with the intact spinneret, you see it's really dark. Well, the dark color is staining for hydrogen peroxide. Again, the glucose oxidase would break down the glucose into hydrogen peroxide. So when a caterpillar feeds on it with intact spinneret, so we didn't mangle it up, and is able to secrete labial saliva, you can see that the glass fiber discs are brown in color in comparison to those with the cauterized spinneret, showing you that the cauterization was successful. However, we've also developed a surgery technique where we remove the salivary glands from caterpillars, pinch it, the caterpillars heal, and we have caterpillars with and without salivary glands that can feed on plants or glass fiber discs or whatever for your experiments. Here's evidence that the, this, this sublation works really well. So what I did is I allowed caterpillars again to feed on those glass fiber discs, and then I rinsed off the glass fiber disc into a microcentrifuge tube and spun it down and so forth, and then did an enzyme assay on it, on what was actually secreted on the paper. And so what I found was that if the caterpillars had intact salivary glands and they fed on, fed on that paper, that there was lots of glucose oxidase activity. Or, in fact, there's actually a lot of other factors like leucine aminopeptidase, an enzyme found in the salivary glands of these caterpillars. So again, if they have intact salivary glands and they feed on a paper disc and I do, I wash off the paper disc and do an enzyme assay with a spectrophotometer and so forth, the glucose oxidase activity is much higher from washing off glass fiber discs from caterpillars that fed on it with intact salivary glands. But if I washed off paper discs from caterpillars with ablated salivary glands, you don't see that, uh, you know, that activity. And so it also shows up as um, here where we have glass fiber discs that have been fed on with and without salivary glands. And you can see that the staining of brown staining is much heavier when feeding on glass fiber discs um, you know, with intact, uh, intact salivary glands. We spent a lot of time talking about microarrays in the last couple of lectures. So if you are a little bit confused, it'd be good to refer to those studies. But basically, we have a glass chip like you would use for a microscope. And on it, a robot has printed all these little dots of single-stranded DNA representing a gene sequence. And then we can do these different studies where we allow caterpillars to feed on plants, purify the RNA from the plants, and then we can um, do a microarray on the tomato response, re re stress responses in relationship to salivary glands in the belt. We also can cut leaves and paint on the leaves with salivary gland extract or water or glucose oxidase and see what kind of gene expression takes place. And so that's what this picture is showing you here. We've had caterpillars with and without salivary glands feeding on tomato plants or wounding and painting on salivary gland extract. We purify all of the RNA from the different treatments respectively. Again, total RNA includes things like messenger RNA, but it also includes things like ribosomal RNA and transfer RNA. We're specifically interested in messenger RNA because that represents gene expression. Those messenger RNA transcripts usually correspond to one particular type of protein. We do reverse transcription in this particular experiment to make cDNA colored either with a green dye or a red dye, Psi3 and Psi5, and then we place it on a microarray chip, hybridize it overnight, and then we look at the spots 
And, you know, we can see qualitatively green or red or yellow, but we also analyze it with the computer to get the amount of fluorescence. And that gives us a relative amount of whether this particular gene was turned on in regards to the caterpillar treatment with salivary glands or without salivary glands. And that's what's shown right in this particular picture here. So again, we have experiments with caterpillars with and without salivary glands feeding on tomato plants. We purify the RNA, we make the cDNA, and now we can put on microchips, microarray chips and see what genes are being turned on out of 10,000, 15,000 genes in a tomato plant. Is the saliva affecting these genes? Or have been wound the plants do the same thing? A lot of this work was initially started here, but some of it was also done uh, with the help of the Max Planck Institute with Heiko Vogel. You may have remembered uh, our speaker today talked about Heiko meeting or having um, Heiko Vogel as one of the co-authors. This is a research place in Germany, Jena, Germany. There's many Max, there's actually many Max Planck Institutes. This one is for chemical ecology. Some might be for paleontology or economy or economics or something like that. But this one is specifically for chemical ecology. So, so it's amazing to think about it. This facility is all about plant herbivore interactions. Um, I don't know the whole story about Max Planck other than he was obviously extremely rich guy, um, anti-fascist, well, well anti-fascist, he wasn't a Nazi, just to put it bluntly, but he lived through that era. And then when he died, he provided all this money um, to build up these research institutions around Germany. Jena, Germany is actually formerly East Germany, so it's kind of neat. So I got to go to the eastern side of Germany after the wall came down and uh, visit this facility. And I really need to make another trip out there. Everything works computer, you know, we should maybe take a look at that tonight. Maybe let's take, before we call it a night, we're gonna take a look at their website. Anyway, here's some of the gene expression where we measured, um, gene expression for certain genes, like this one's a protease inhibitor too. Remember, protease inhibitors block the ability for caterpillars to digest proteins. And so we see in this um, qPCR or microarray experiment that the mock treatment actually stimulates the protease inhibitors a little bit more than the ablated treatment. So in this case, caterpillar saliva may be stimulating protease inhibitors a little bit more, or maybe they're feeding us a little bit more aggressively. We try to control the amount of feeding, of course. Here we've wounded plants and painted on water, autoclave salivary gland extract, salivary gland extract, or glucose oxidase. Here's our non-wounded treatment. Notice that the protease inhibitors are extremely low for the non-wounded treatments relative to the wounded treatments. If you wound a plant and paint on water, it's tenfold higher. Oh, actually, I should look better. 25-fold higher. And that's kind of pretty much the same across the board. So it doesn't seem like saliva is doing a lot to increase or decrease it. But interestingly enough, if you give a purified glucose oxidase, it actually increases um, this protease inhibitor. So there may be other factors in the saliva that are counteracting that. So again, we looked at lots of different plant defenses like trypsin inhibitor and chymotrypsin inhibitor. In these studies, it didn't seem like saliva was doing a lot in comparison to water. Arginase actually seems to be stimulated by saliva though. It's a little bit higher, and you can see that the standard air bars do not overlap. And this is particularly true for the block, the mock treatment versus the ablated treatment. Arginase is another type of plant defense. 
where the arginase enzyme actually breaks down arginine, the amino acid, so it's no longer a suitable um, amino acid for the caterpillar to utilize. Because remember, caterpillars need their amino acids to build their own proteins. And so if you take out an essential amino acid like arginine, arginine that it can reduce the caterpillar's growth. So it seems that arginase, arginase is being affected by caterpillar saliva. And it seems like glucose oxidase may be responsible for it. So you can see the arginase levels are really low for the non-wounded treatment, substantially higher when wounded, but even higher so for the saliva treatment and the glucose oxidase treatment. So this provides evidence that this enzyme is probably this anti-nutritive defense arginase, this enzyme that the plant has made is being stimulated by saliva and glucose oxidase. We also have pretty good evidence that other types of genes are being turned on because of saliva, like endochitinase. Acidic endochitinase seems to be particularly triggered by water, especially in the mock and the blade. I'm not sure exactly what's going on here. Um, might need to do a follow-up study, but the mock and the blighted, there was a substantial difference. So something in the saliva, maybe glucose oxidase, was stimulating acidic endokinase. We know, I don't know exactly what the value of that is. It may be stimulating the plant's ability to resist pathogens. Also keep in mind that, because pathogens like fungi have chitin, but also keep in mind that insects also have chitin as um, their exoskeleton. So there's lots of things that might be going on here. But it does seem at least, that I think there's potential and evidence that and from a lot of other studies that we've done, that chitinases, especially acidic endochinases, are being stimulated by caterpillar saliva. We see this again when we wounded the plants with scissors. If you paint on water or non-wounded, they're about the same, but when you paint on saliva, it really gets stimulated, even over autoclave saliva. Well, in this case, it doesn't look like glucose oxidase is doing much. Maybe there's some other factor. And so we see this over again. Here's a, an abscisic acid-induced gene that seems to be stimulated in part by saliva. Again, the standard air bars are overlapping and it's the highest for the saliva treatment. This may be a drought resistance gene. There's a lot more that needs to be studied about that. We see that the mock saliva really stimulates it as well. So this abscisic acid really seems to be stimulated by caterpillar saliva. This here is a graph of the microarray study. So these were all figures of and then here's just examples of different ones. So here you can see the acidic chitinase. I'll just highlight it. It's being particularly stimulated by the saliva treatment. But I'm not sure what's going on here with the water. Um, again, we're seeing arginase seems to be higher for the saliva, but it's not significantly different. They have the same letters. Um, but there's a, gen a general trend that these genes are more stimulated higher, more highly by the saliva treatment than the autoclave treatment. We also did a bioassay and looked at the growth of caterpillars on these various treatments. So we have caterpillar average body weights in grams. So on day one, they're all the same weight. Um, they're neonates to fresh out of their eggs. And then after six days, you start seeing differences. So if we wounded the plant, um, they tend to grow worse than a non-wounded plant. So here's the non-wounded plant. So caterpillars grow best on non-wounded tomato plants. And worse on wounded tomato plants. And then these were just different factors that we painted on. Here's labial salivary gland extract, glucose oxidase. There does seem to be some potential differences. I don't, but they were statistically different when I did, ran the stats on it. It probably means I need to run more um, 
replications because you can see some trends that are pretty strong. Interestingly enough, when I applied leucine aminopeptidase, another factor that we found in the saliva, there is a reduction, an even greater reduction in growth. So again, this was one of the first studies that really looked at um, caterpillar um, gene expression with caterpillars with the surgery. Before that, there hadn't been a lot of surgery experiment. I don't think there has been since there either. But basically, we're seeing that the wounding and the saliva seems to be stimulating some of these plant defenses, uh, particularly things like acidic endokinase and dehydrin. This, you know, so there may some of these defenses like arginase may be stimulated due to glucose oxidase. But again, what we're seeing is that there's a, at least a quantitative difference, and in some cases, almost a qualitative difference, like for arginase. So and the acidic endokinase. So again, another experiment that has shown that caterpillar saliva has an effect. A more complete um, analysis of this was done in one of the papers. I don't know if you all read that one or not. I think I signed it already. But anyway, that was, so we did get a publication out of this. So does anybody have any questions? I kept it kind of short and sweet tonight. If not, I'd like to show you the Mox Planck Institute um, from their website. I think you'll be really impressed of what kind of research facilities they have over there. It's pretty mind blowing. Kylie, did you have a question? I saw this blue streak. That's kind of interesting. Okay, I'm going to stop the. I'm going to stop the. Uh, Recording. Pause the recording. All right. See you, Morgan. Anyway, that pretty much wraps it up for tonight. Does anybody have any thoughts or comments? Okay, well, I hope you got something out of the, today's lecture. Um, maybe after spring break, if some people are interested, um, we could talk about doing something in the lab. It, it might be pretty modest because of COVID. Um, otherwise, we probably need to start looking up a paper or two and start putting together so, yourself a little bit of a PowerPoint for a topic that you're interested. Has everybody started getting a topic idea that they wanted? I know some, one person mentioned following up on the kudus and acacias. I think Lindsay mentioned something about big herbivores. Has anybody else thought about a topic? Is that a negative? <laughs> I can make it an assignment if you want, but we need to probably start thinking about maybe a plant animal interaction story that you would like to talk about. And again, the sky's the limit. It doesn't have to be caterpillars and plants. It can be anything you want. I've been looking at some papers on um, monarch overwintering sites in Central California, but I'm trying to come up with a connection that would make it um, like chemically or genetically relevant to the class. Okay. Anybody else have some ideas or pollination or ecological something or other? Uh, Cameron or Carter or Conley, Taylor, Carly. Anybody want to add? All right, so let's say on the next plan is next week that you have at least a couple of topic ideas that you can mention in class. 
Otherwise, I think that's it for tonight. You know, thanks again, everybody. Thank you. Yep, take care.